Hi, dog. Hi, how are you? Fine. This is your side here. This is my what? Where you just side? It's scary. Ah. <laughs> Oh, don't be scared. <laughs> so, um, when I spoke to the HOD, okay, he didn't have any answers or solutions. This one never does. Hello, dog. <laughs> This man never has yeah. answers. So. <laughs> yeah, so, um, well, I was just asking for the sake of asking, but I okay. knew that he wouldn't really be forthcoming. Oh, yes. So, um, what I decided was that in the light of yesterday's presidential address, I am hoping that um, school will resume soon. For us? So, yes. For you, oh. have I shared the slide, or it hasn't come yet? It has. I have actually sent it across. No, I mean the screen. Have I shared it? No. No, I don't. No. no okay. Yet. No. So let me share it now. Okay. You can see it now. Yeah. Okay. So, so the decision from KNUSD. Okay. Okay. Has to have um, assessments. Okay. Um, play three to five assessments and use that. I'm of the opinion that we need both, both the exam and then the assessments. So from tomorrow, I put some assessments on um, the Google Classroom. Okay. For you to do. Um, but I would still prefer it to be written out, not um, typed, because it's, it's, it's better for learning when you write it out. And so when school reopens, then I'll mark and input them. Um, so we will not have mid-semester exams. That would form the, the total of the 30 marks. And this time around, I'm not going to mark for assessment because there's no way of tracking. Mm -hmm. It's also unfair. Depends on what you're doing. You may not avail yourself for that. And so we'll have, I'm still yet to decide, between three and five assignments, um, written assignments. That will be your 30%. If we are able to resume in the next one month, then as soon as we resume we'll have exams so that will be your 70 percent as usual but if there's any issue and we can't resume then i'll have to make the five assignments um 100 percent and then we'll split it up into okay. a medicine and main exam so that is my decision with, with regards to that. then then um with regards to your clinicals, there's no plan from the school. Hey. And so what I've decided is that we will have the clinicals during the, if school reopens, then we'll have the clinicals during the vacation. So in that case, you get a letter, a cover letter from the school, you bring it to the hospital, and then you can come in batches. But when you come, I will teach you. You'll be assigned to me, and then I'll teach you. Are we OK? Uh, we'll take it like that, Radford. Hmm. That is, yeah, that that's is what's happening. OK, so let's start. Um, so today, we are talking about environmental Madam, diseases. A quick question, Madam, please, a quick question regarding the, uh, this thing. What's the name? Uh, the clinic house. Uh, when you say we're going to come in budgets, are we going to come like a week on weekly basis or once a week? Please, if you can clarify it before us. So it depends on the number who are interested. Because of the need for the social distancing, a lot at the goal. So maybe it doesn't have to be most students at the goal. So since you are 36, it depends on how many people are interested. If then maybe each each group can come once a week. 
So it depends. So that by the end of one week, if, so let's say if you are 30, let's say 30 people are interested. There are five days in a week. So we can have six people per day who will come in two batches. So three per batch. So maybe I can allocate two hours to teaching your, your, your group. So you can have maybe two to one to two o'clock, three people, then two to three o'clock, three people, or anything like that. So by the end of the week, the whole, all the 30 people that have been, have uh -huh. That's that, good. So that by the end of one month, you would have done at least four um, so we'll see how it goes. Mm. Um, so probably I am thinking that the exams might be written in July because schools are now going to start with the final years in June. So if it goes well, then probably in July, you guys are going to come. So after the exams and all that, we are looking at August for your clinicals. Okay. So start um, tuning your mind to that. So for the clinicals, it will, fit, it will be the same. We would, you have a patient, you take the history, but then I'll teach you how to do the examination. So we'll take the examination in systems. Okay, so this, this slide, I usually don't like to teach it because I, I think it's very basic and it doesn't really need much of. It's, it's not that difficult to understand. So mostly environmental diseases has to do with things in the environment that cause disease. So major outdoor pollutants like the ozone, like carbon monoxide, particulate matter, and what they do to the body. Then um, the main thing here about the air pollutant is that when they are smaller in diameter, they are able to go further. So the smaller particles will get into the lungs. The larger particles will be trapped by the mucociliary um, escalator. So that has to do with the mucus would trap it or the cilia will blow it such that it can be coughed out. Okay. So there are some patterns of injury that occur as a result of air pollution. So you can have an acute or chronic inflammation. So an example is bronchitis. Then you can have emphysema. Emphysema means breakdown of the proteins in the alveolar walls. So you have dissolution or uh, digestion of the alveolar walls, and then you have larger areas without any possibility of air exchange. You can also have asthma as a result of um, air pollution, hypersensitivity reaction, pneumoconiosis, and then neoplasia. So neoplasia is cancer as a result of the same air pollution. When it comes to, um, so those are outdoor pollutants, but indoor, you can have all these um, agents causing um, damage to the lungs. So wood smoke, radon. So radon is a radioactive substance derived from uranium. It is present in the soil and it is usually commonly found in places where you have nuclear waste disposal and it is associated with lung cancer. Then the bioaerosols are the ones that are capable of forming and um, giving rise to allergic reactions. So the, the house dust mites, the mold, the cockroach dust, the animal dander and those things, they are the ones that can trigger an asthmatic attack. Okay. So from the air, air pollutants, we move to toxic and carcinogenic um, metals. So lead is number one. And um, then we have mercury, cadmium, and arsenic. What is important for me, for you to know, is that one, these metals can cause 
problems. And then also know the particular exposures. So for example, if you know that, okay, beryllium can cause acute lung hypersensitivity is a lung irritant. And you're taking the history. You know that people who work in ceramics are prone to this. So when you take the history and you ask and the occupation fits it, then you know that, okay, with this occupation, you can have this exposure. So it's possible that that is why the patient is having the problem they are presenting with. So basically, those are the things that I want you to take note of when you read about the toxic and carcinogenic metals. Now, smoking, smoking is increasingly becoming common in our setting. And these days, people don't just smoke cigarettes. They smoke all sorts of things. <laughs> <My one>. mm. <laughs> so, um... <laughs> tobacco smoke is associated with cancer. But I'm sure what you didn't know was the fact that there are all sorts of other things that are associated with tobacco smoke. We have um, myocardial infarction, atherosclerosis, bronchitis and emphysema. You can have oral cancer. You can have um, throat cancer as a result of smoking. Okay. So these are some other things that are in, in the smoke. So for example, formaldehyde, which is in the tobacco smoke, can be toxic to the cilia. The cilia are in the respiratory airway and they are hair-like processes that blows um, nauseous substances in the airways away so that it doesn't get to the lungs. So if you have formaldehyde being present in the tobacco smoke and it's toxic to the cilia, what will happen is all these things will not be blown away so they will end up in the lungs. Now, maternal smoking has been shown to have an adverse effect on the fetus. So, smoking continuous abortion. And if the baby is not aborted, there is an increased risk of premature delivery. With it, associated problems with um, preterm delivery in terms of respiration, in terms of maturity of the organ systems, in terms of immunity. Then also the smoking can result in intrauterine growth retardation and how does this occur? So um, if the mother smokes, it causes vasoconstriction of the blood vessels. And so the amount of blood that goes through the placenta to the fetus is decreased. And if the amount of blood is decreased, it means that the amount of nutrients and oxygen that's become available to the fetus are decreased. And so the growth of the fetus will be retarded. Okay, so that's what causes the intrauterine growth retardation. It has been realized that mothers who stop smoking before the pregnancy, they have normal birth weight babies. But when they smoke in the course of the pregnancy, then they have this effect. Passive smoking is also harmful. So passive smoking is secondhand smoking whereby you are in the vicinity of someone who smokes. And mostly the effect is on children. So children living in, an, in a household with an adult who smokes have an increased um, risk of and asthma. And so here too, when you are taking the history, that is why when you are taking history of children, it's important for you to find out if the parents smoke. And it's also important for you to find out if they abuse alcohol because that can also affect um, socially how they interact with their parents. <laughs> when you look at, um, when you look at oh, chemical... Pick one before you continue. Okay. And, and when, when a woman smokes, let's say he used to smoke, can that one um, have an effect on she getting a pregnant or something? On she getting what? Pregnant. Like the smoking causing fertility. Yes, something like that. I don't think so, but I don't know. It, 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 it isn't one of the things that causes infertility, but I don't know. I may be wrong. Okay. But from what I know, it doesn't. I know, I know rather that smoking has an effect on sperm production, but for female fertility, no, not that I know of. 
but um, just a quick one. Um, with the smoking on the, on uh, milk sperm production, um, what is the uh, pathology behind that one? So um, it decreases the capacity to produce the sperm, and then it also causes abnormal abnormalities in the sperms. So it can also cause low sperm count. So sperm abnormalities and low sperm count. Ola, are you listening? <laughs> okay. So chemical agents. And a lot, yeah, of, the chemical, yeah, okay. a lot okay. of chemicals abound in our environment and they all cause harm one way or the other. So there are certain things that determine um, how bad the poisoning by chemical agents is. So as a practical example, if you are in the consulting room and they rush a child and say that maybe the child has drunk some bleach, um, there are certain specific questions that you need to ask to determine how bad the poisoning is. So the first thing is the dosage. How much did the child take? The more the child takes, the more likely that it will cause damage. Then, is this a chemical that is metabolized in the body before it becomes harmful? Or can it be harmful in its raw state? This is also an important question to ask. So there are certain drugs like um, paracetamol, which are metabolized to another drug before it becomes toxic. So those drugs, if you take them, depending on the time between when you took and when they reported, you might be able to get it out of the system by um, emptying the stomach. And so you might be able to prevent a toxic effect. But if the drug itself is toxic, then it means that it doesn't really matter how long the patient has had it, it can still cause an effect. Then it's also important for you to know the site of absorption, accumulation, or secretion. So a drug like aminoglycoside, uh, gets accumulated in the ear and the renal cortex. So examples of aminoglycoside antibiotics, agentamycin, amitacin. So these drugs will sort of concentrate in the ear and in the kidneys. And that is explains why they cause autotoxicity and nephrotoxicity. Then it's also important for you to take into cognizance the fact that there are individual variation in terms of how we respond to poisons. So somebody might take the same thing, the same quantity, but because of genetic um, differences in how we metabolize, how quickly we metabolize things, or how slowly we metabolize things, somebody might show a very bad effect of the toxin, and somebody too might be okay. Um, then some um, chemicals also, um, induce an immune response. And the immune response is what causes the damage. An example, people with penicillin allergy, when they, they take the penicillin, it is not the penicillin that causes the problem. It is the allergy to the penicillin that causes acute inflammation and causes tissue damage. Okay, so now let's look at physical agents. So we've looked at air pollution, we've looked at metals, we've looked at chemicals. Now we are looking at physical agents. So physical agents are things that cause physical injury to the cell. So mechanical trauma, heat or thermal injury, electrical injury, and then injury by ionizing radiation. So for me mechanical trauma, there are several types, road traffic accidents, a cut, a laceration, whatever. The effect of the mechanical trauma on the tissues of the body depends on one, the shape of the colliding agent, the amount of energy that is discharged at the impact, and then the tissues that will bear the impact. So let me give an example. Now, if you have a blunt object causing a collision or colliding or impinging on a tissue of the body, that blunt object will cause less trauma compared to a sharp or a penetrating object. So if somebody, um, the same force, and then you have a, a like a, a knife, 
a knife wound compared to maybe the same force that is used to slap somebody or to hit somebody with the, maybe a hammer or something. The knife will cause worse injury because it is a sharp object. Then the amount of energy at the impact. The kind of injury that will occur with a road traffic accident in which there is collusion is different from the kind of injury that will occur when maybe somebody is hit with a blunt object. Then the tissues or organs are bad impact. So if the head undergoes, um, if there's impact on the head, for example, because of the skull, the hard protection of the skull, unless the, the, the impact is so strong, the skull might protect you. Compared to if you have the same impact on the abdomen, there's no bony protection of the abdomen, so the injury would be worse. Okay. Look, uh, now it looks like yeah. Christian's hand is up. Maybe he wants to ask a question. Christian. Okay, ask your question. No, please, I'm okay. Thank you. I'm okay. I've gotten it. I've gotten it. Thank you very much. Okay. So I, there's yeah. morphological types of injuries. You can have an abrasion. So the difference, an abrasion is when the superficial layer of the skin is removed. Then you can have a contusion whereby there's damage to internal organs, blood vessels, and then there's extravasation, that is um, release of blood into the tissues. Then in the laceration, you have a tear or um, stretching of the tissue. And it's usually from a sharp object or a blunt object. And the edges are usually irregular. In an incised wound, this is usually from a sharp object. Then puncture wound is from a penetrating injury. So a knife, a spear, a sharp metal, gunshot, okay. So usually when you observe the nature of the wound, you are able to tell a lot of things. And this helps in forensics. So forensics or the forensic pathologist is somebody who deals with the dynamics of the tissue injury from um, blunt or penetrating trauma. And is able to tell sometimes even the kind of object that is used to um, cause the injury or how far it is, depending on things that they see at the site, like powder burns from a gunshot or um, the kind of entry and exit wounds that are created. So vehicular accidents, um, they, they lead to mechanical injury in the tissue. And um, they usually result from either the person is trapped in the vehicle and there's an impact or thrown out of the vehicle or they hit parts of the interior of the vehicle. Sometimes you can have all these three things occurring. In, um, there are several things that can determine the pattern of injury. Whether the person was in a seat belt, for example, we determine if there's a head injury by impinging on the windscreen, for example. Or you can have a whiplash injury from the seat belt because the patient is thrown forward and then backwards after deceleration. So picture that the, the, the vehicle is moving at a certain speed. Then there's a sudden impact. Once there's a sudden impact, the body continues moving forward for some time. But because of the restraint of the seat belt, there's a deceleration, so the body moves back. And that can cause a whiplash injury from the seat belt. So it depends on what is happening to the person while the person is in the wound. So if, this is um, an example of aortic rupture following a road traffic accident. There was um, a transection of the aorta and definitely this led to death because the aorta is a very big 
um, blood vessel. And so with the rapture, you can imagine how much blood will be lost. Okay, Doc, okay. Nat's hand is up. Nat? Yeah. Um, there's a quick question. Um, I was um, reading some articles some time ago, and then I realized that someone had an injury had a scar without knowing that he had an injury too. He was, someone noticed it, that this was the injury. What can cause such things for the person to go undetected or having any pain that, okay, maybe a, it was a gunshot, sorry. The person did not feel that there was a gun, nothing in there. So someone acknowledged and then told the person that this is what they see. What can be the cause behind this thing? I don't even understand your question. So the person was shot and didn't know he was shot. Yes. That was the thing. Come again. You are saying that somebody was shot and didn't know shot. he was shot. No, he was shot. Yes. Did not know that the bullet was in. So someone discovered that he has been so shot. That's different, but <laughs> so someone discovered he had been shot. Yes. But when he was shot, was he sleeping? <laughs> uh, it was like an astray bullet. <laughs> okay, article with my article with my mom. Not article, madam. Because she's just been in heaven. A lot of people. Madam, 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 how did he not know? Yeah, how did he not yes. feel the pain? I think that's I what I wonder. Negative article. No, it, it, actually, um, I know movies are movies, but Grey's Anatomy, people were pierced with metal and they couldn't feel anything. And they explained it that they said adrenaline or something is blocking their senses from receiving the pain. So I think that's where Nat wants to come from. So yeah, at yeah. the point of the impact, the person could be in shock yeah. and may not feel anything. But afterwards, you feel the pain. Mm. It doesn't last forever. You feel it afterwards. So, so are you saying that the person pointed it out to him later, like months? Yes, or he was discovered or by someone. Months? Yes, someone. He was like he was shot, and when he got home, he never knew he was shot till. Uh, the sister told him ah, what happened till so they saw the pay the blood oozing and that's when the guy got to know he's been shot. Madam, Madam, my next story. So did he get oozing from his head? Mister, believe. You see, Madam, um, yeah, Madam, Madam, go on. Ask time for some this. Let's go on. Please, I have a question. Please, I have a question. Okay. Please, I want to know whether a dog bite would that be a lacerated wound or what kind of wound would that be? So there's a break. Like... There's a yeah. break of the skin. Yes. It's not a, it's not a lacerated case. I'm trying to, sorry. So that is, it can be an incised wound. Okay. So that's an incised wound. Is your question answered? Yeah, so if we are uh, when you are taking the history and you have to write, would that will you be right stating it's like incised wound as a result of a dog bite or something? I want to yeah, see you how you can write that in your diagnosis. Okay. But madam, so, madam yes. some of the bites can take part of the skin away. Some of the what? The bite. Yeah. Uh -huh. It may take part of the tissues away. Yes, so, so it's, still a, that, it's still an incised or yes. I, I was thinking that because part of the tissues are taken away. So what will it be? A laceration or so. 
No. If you go back, go back and read the. I've sent you the notes. A laceration is a cut, and it it's a. Um, it is like a, a linear wound. Okay. A no. wound. A wound is a deeper. Is a deeper. Um. Is a deeper ulcer. You're okay. So a, a wound is bigger than a laceration. Okay, okay. Okay, so we'll look at bends. Now, um, the clinical significance of the bends depends on how deep the bend is, how much of the body is involved, and then if there are other injuries, like injury from inhalation, and then how quickly the therapy was instituted, and then infection control. So looking at the thickness, we have first and second degree bands, and then we have full thickness bands, which goes through all the thickness of the skin. So the epidermis and the dermis are involved. Now, if the, the band goes through the full thickness, it means that it is going to burn or sever the nerves as well. And so for these bands, the patient may not feel pain because the nerve endings have been bent. Okay, and um, the kind of thing you need to do for therapy depends on how thick the bend is and also how much of the surface of the body is involved. So if you have a lot of um, the body involved, then that patient would lose a lot of fluid because the skin is um, sort of keeping out heat loss and fluid loss. And so if the skin surface is, is gone, it means that there will be a lot of fluid being lost and that can be substantial enough even to cause hypovolemic um, So if you assess the patient and the patient has bands covering more than 20% of the body surface area, this patient is at risk of shock and so you need to admit this patient. Um, inhalation injury can usually occur when the patient is trapped in a building, a burning building. So they inhale the hot smoke. So that inhaled air uh, causes damage to the respiratory epithelium in addition to the burns that they have on their, on their skin. This inhalation will produce inflammation and swelling. And that swelling can be so bad that it can actually block the airway and lead to um, hypoxia. And the patient may even die from this compared to the shock that will occur from the bends on the body. We have something we call burn sepsis. Now look at it in this context. The skin is supposed to serve as a, a barrier against microorganisms. Now when you have bends, the skin is gone. So there's no barrier. The other thing is also that you have all the serum um, oozing out from the skin. And that is very rich um, medium for bacteria to grow and it supports the growth of microorganisms. So these two factors will help to lead to infection. Um, so the most common organisms usually um, is Pseudomonas aeruginosa, but you can also have Staph aureus and and then fungi, especially candida species. And this infection can be so bad that it can lead to organ failure, um, from pneumonia, septic shock, renal failure, and then acute respiratory distress syndrome. So we'll look at um, injury from heat. So hyperthermia. There are three um, main main types. You can have heat cramps, heat exhaustion, and heat stroke. So heat cramps usually occur when you've been in the sun for a long time, prolonged physical activity, and there's loss of electrolytes from electrolytes would lead to cramping of the muscles. And there's also um, high oh, as against heat exhaustion. For heat exhaustion, usually it is associated with prostration and collapse, and usually occurs from water depletion. So 
in the earlier stage. So it's like progression. So you can progress from heat cramps to heat exhaustion. For both of them, the etiology is still the excessive sweating. However, for the heat exhaustion, because of um, water depletion from the excessive sweating, you can actually go into shock. So the patient can have hypovolemic shock and then collapse. Then heat stroke is um, a situation whereby there's excessive sweating as a compensatory mechanism of the body to try and cool the body down. So when there's a, a lot of heat, there's excessive sweating. When the heat is, the fluid is on the surface of the body, when it evaporates, it takes heat energy from the skin. And in the process, it cools the body. The thermoregulatory mechanisms will fail. And then sweating will cease. So as sweating ceases, then the core body temperature will increase. So the body temperature can increase to as high as 42 degrees Celsius. And erectile temperature can also go as high as 40 degrees. And usually these patients, they die. Um, commonly, this occurs in the scenario where maybe a child is left in a car parked in the sun with the windows rolled up. And usually, if the child stays in for a long time, they go through all these stages, the cramping, the heat exhaustion, and then finally, the heat stroke. Okay. So we look at the other extreme, hypothermia, whereby there is high humidity, there is wet clothing, so the patient is cold as a result of being exposed to very low temperatures. So let's say a patient who has drowned um, has been in the water for a long time and has been taken out. When the temperature goes below 33 degrees Celsius, the patient will lose consciousness and then there'll be bradycardia, that slowing of the heart. And you also have atrial fibrillation or irregular heartbeat. Now, all these things occur and lead to loss of consciousness because the heart rate is very slow. So it's not able to pump the blood to all the systems of the body. Um, it leads to several things. You can have vasoconstriction, um, temperature change leading to decreased enzymatic action, and decreased rates of uh, metabolism in the body. And it can also lead to atrophy and fibrosis. Um, you can have hypoxia because the blood is not flowing to bring oxygen to the various tissues. And this can lead to necrosis and ischemic injury. So you can have a situation whereby, especially if it affects the extremities, the patients can lose their toes or their fingers because of the extreme cold. Okay. I think we have less than a minute. I'm so sure how we'll is the losing of the toes um, uh, as a result of extreme cold different from, um, uh, what did they call this thing? Uh, when your, your fingers freeze and then you have to. Uh, no, I don't want to remember. Frost by. Frost by. Yes, frostbite. Yeah, so it's the same thing. So this is trying to explain the mechanism of frostbite. Frostbite, okay. okay. So the extreme cold, you are not able to perfuse the extremity. So blood doesn't go there. So you lose out on oxygen and nutrients, and then the cells there can die, undergo gangrene and necrosis. And